Welcome to Pathophysiology. My name is Dr. Janet miller monfolks and I am going to be your professor this semester. So um, what I'm going to do is I will make videos for each of the different um, chapters and I will upload them and then during class we're actually going to do a discussion. So you can go and revisit these um, PowerPoints as you see fit and you can go back and review. So let's talk about chapter one, and this is what is pathophysiology? Well, a whole lot of things in science, and we have talked about this in all of biology, physiology, et cetera, is homeostasis. And so what is homeostasis? Well, this is the maintenance of a relatively stable internal environment, regardless of external changes. So when homeostasis is maintained, good health is generally maintained. And also when homeostasis is not maintained, then diseases may develop. And we're going to be talking about how those diseases that diseases develop in this course, which is pathophysiology. So an example is, okay, our um, physiologic temperature is what, 37 degrees Celsius. Right now in this lovely state of Michigan, it is freezing cold and there's snow outside. So it's like 20 some odd degrees. So I guess not freezing cold, but it's cold. So I can go outside and um, I'm going to still maintain my body temperature for a while. Obviously, we wear coats, and if you're out there for an extended period of time, you could go into hypothermia. But homeostasis means that I can go outside, I can do some things, I can um, exercise and, you know, produce lactic acid, and we have um, mechanisms and ways to get rid of that lactic acid so that I don't take into acidosis, right? So homeostasis is that static level that we try to maintain. Okay, so how does this uh, factor into health and disease? Well, what is health? Health is the physical, mental, and social well-being of us. Disease, then, is deviation from that normal homeostatic state. And so, again, everything that we get to learn about in this class, which is going to be very cool, is what goes wrong with normal in order to make a disease occur. So there are some definitions that we need to know about, and one of them is health indicators. <clears throat> so normal values occur within a range of values, and they may vary depending on technology used for the measurement. And so some of these would be like, you know, temperature and, you know, blood pH, et cetera, you know, a whole bunch of things that we're normally testing. Adjustments in these health indicators <clears throat> can be caused by a lot of different things. One is age gender, genetics, environmental factor, environment and environmental factors, as well as your activity level. And so a reoccurring um, you know, theme through all of this is how age can affect the progression or the onset of diseases, how male versus female, um, the way things affect our bodies is, is different, et cetera. Um, you know, eating healthy and activity is actually really good for your body. And so we're going to be talking about the positive benefits of that as well. So what about the scope? and the concepts of pathophysiology. Well, these functional or physiologic changes in the body are a result of these diseases. And so we're gonna use the knowledge that we learned in basic anatomy and physiology, and then we're going to include that and look holistically and um, specifically look at the pathology, so the changes in the structural body tissues, right, that are caused by the diseases. So we're going to be, um, you know, looking at our normal, and then the pathology is how things changed off of normal and how these changes can cause that disease, okay? So we're going to be including the pathology, looking at cell differentiation and, you know, the different um, causes and effects, et cetera. And again, looking at causing and cause and effect relationships, and these are defined by signs and symptoms. And basically, this is going to guide the study of a specific disease. We also want to talk about how to prevent diseases. And this has become a primary focus in healthcare. Maybe not exactly today because we're in the middle of a COVID pandemic, but overall, we want to try to be healthier so that things are not as prevalent as we age. So a lot of health has really come into, um, you know, making sure that we are just healthy overall. So we want to maintain routine vaccination programs, um, you know, for the measles and rubella and, you know, all of the ones that you get when you're a child. Um, the participation in health screening programs. My mom is, um, you know, obviously a little bit older than me. And, uh, you know, she does bone screening um, just to make sure that she has a clue on what's going on. And then you also have 
the community health programs. I know that our um, farmers market has, you know, a community health booth that's there and every week that they um, give out like healthy recipes and tips and tricks, exercises, et cetera. And then also make sure that we do, um, you know, routine doctor visits to make sure that we can catch things quickly or maintain a, a standard of health. We also look at research. Now, I used to be a bench scientist, right? So my PhD is actually in physiology and I specialized in neuroscience. And so I ran a lab and I worked on hydrocephalus, which is the babies with the big heads, right? And so I was actually a basic scientist and I actually was um, involved in a couple of clinical studies for hydrocephalus uh, shunts and uh, different things as well. So um, the different stages of the research process would be stage one is the basic science. And this is the identification of technology that can be used to study these diseases. You're gonna work in a laboratory, you're gonna be doing the test tube um, tests and actually looking for um, you know, cellular changes. And some of these might be um, you know, in vitro or in vivo models where we might be using animals or cell and tissue cultures to study things at the cellular level. Stage two would be um, when you start to do the clinical study, and this is going to be a small number of human subjects that are going to be subjected to, um, you know, whatever treatment that you studied in the animal model. Um, and then stage three would be your clinical trials, and these are involving a large number of patients with a disease or the risk of the disease. And what these are for a good study would be using a double-blind study. And double-blind studies just mean that neither the patient nor the administration doctor or the administering doctor know whether or not you're getting the actual treatment or the placebo. Okay. And so it's double-blind. The only person that knows uh, who got what is the actual researcher. And it's through a series of coded uh, names and data. Uh, banks so that you can't figure out who um, who gets it. Um, and this is actually kind of cool because, again, we're in the middle of a pandemic at the time of this recording. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation about the vaccines that are now being uh, administered to the general population. Well, actually, it's clinical still, but um, it's available to um, more than just the clinical trial because uh, they feel that the clinical trials were rushed. So that would be a fun little discussion to have during class. Um, when we look at all of this, we have to make sure that we focus on new developments and trends as well. So there's constant updating of information and knowledge, and this is based on improved diagnostic tests, as well as, um, you know, pharmacologically, we're constantly developing new and more effective drugs. Uh, we have new ways of looking at things. So basically, um, what we want to do so what we want to do is, um, you know, make sure that we keep improving on those technologies so that we can make things quicker, easier, and more um, sensitive during, um, you know, our diagnostic stages. And we also do extensive research and efforts to prevent, control, and cure many different disorders. So what are some of the new challenges that we have? Well, you know, um, now we have the COVID. COVID-19, because we're in the middle of this, but this is actually very pertinent as well because the Zika virus was first discovered in 1947, and it was discovered in tropical Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands. And then it spread, and in um, 2015, there were confirmed cases in Brazil. And now the CDC has identified the virus as an international threat. And again, this was a few years ago when these slides were made. Um, the, there's obviously increased research on diagnosis, the spread and the treatment of prevention. So as it turns out, I was teaching pathophysiology for um, Baker as um, COVID first um, launched, not launched, but broke. Okay, so we actually, um, we um, watched it move from Wuhan, China, all the way over to the States. We talked about different treatments and preventions and stuff. So, um, you know, this is going to be a great class discussion on, you know, using COVID-19 as a real life thing that's happening right now and um, uh, how we can study it and see uh, the pathophysiology actually in effect in our real lives. So basic terminology would be the gross level. So when we're talking about uh, gross anatomy, right, that's the organ or the system level. So that's like the bigger overall level, where then we can um, go and narrow down to the mac microscopic level. And this would be looking at things at the cellular level. A biopsy is going to be an excision of small amounts of living tissue, where an autopsy is the examination of the body and organs after the patient has already died. 
So those are some terms that you need to get familiar with. Um, with the per process of disease, first we have to diagnose it. And so this would be the identification of a basic disease. And so we're going to evaluate the signs and the symptoms. We're going to do some laboratory tests to confirm or um, rule out and then um, go from there. Then we're going to look at the etiology. And this would be the causative factors of that particular disease. So for instance, this could be congenital defects, inherited or genetic disorders, microorganisms, immunologic dysfunctions, degenerative changes, uh, malignancies, metabolic or nutritional problems, as well as trauma, burns, and again, those environmental factors, and how all of these can factor into the process and the development of a disease. Um, some more terminology is you have some causes of disease. Idiopathic means eh, we really don't know, but we are looking into it, right? So um, idiopathic is the cause of the disease is unknown. Uh, Latrogenic means that there was an error or a treatment or a procedure that may have caused the disease. And then we have a predisposing um, factors, and those would be like age, gender, inherited factors, environmental influence, etc. Um, prophylaxis, <laughs> this is going to be what we can do to preserve health and also to prevent the spread of diseases. And then we also have prevention, and this would be like vaccinations, the dietary lifestyle modifications, and the prevention of potentially harmful activities, etc. When we look at characterizing the diseases, we have, again, more terminology, and this would be the pathogenesis, and this is the development of the disease. You have the onset of the disease, which can be either sudden or acute, same word, right? So acute means a very quick onset. Or we can have insidious, insidious, which would be your general vague or mild signs and symptoms so that we're not quite exactly sure what it is yet because it hasn't become full-blown. An acute disease, again, that acute means it's going to be sudden onset, right? And usually those are going to be short term and they develop very quickly. And some examples of this could be like high fever, severe pain, etc. Where chronic diseases, these tend to develop more gradually and you have milder symptoms that are often um, intermittent with acute episodes. So you can have, you can feel normal, then you can feel sick, then you can feel normal, then you can feel sick. And so this vacillation makes it a little bit harder to um, diagnose a chronic disease. It can. Um, subclinical state means that we have pathologic changes, like at the cellular level, but we don't have any obvious manifestations physiologically. And so um, it's not quite presenting clinically yet. Um, the latent stage, this is when you have the disease, but you have no signs or clinical symptoms that are evident for diagnosis. And so in infectious diseases, this would be like the incubation period. So kind of like how you can transfer COVID, um, you know, and people can look healthy, but you can still get it and, you know, test positive for it, even though it hasn't had a full blown yet. Okay. Um, you have your prodromal period, and this is where we have our early development of the disease, and the signs are nonspecific or absent. I kind of feel a little punky. I have a slight fever. I'm just not feeling quite right, things like that. And then you have your manifestations, and these would be the clinical evidence with signs and symptoms, examples being that they're, it's local. So I have, well, actually, I threw my back out today. So you have stabbing pain in your lower back, right? So you have a local, which would be at the site of the problem. Or you can have systematic, which would be through your entire body. And this would be um, like your general indicators of illness, such as fever. <clears throat> um, some of your signs can be objective indicators of the disease. Your symptoms can be subjective feelings. So objective signs means fever. Um, there's a laceration or lesions or whatever. You can actually um, see it. Lesions are in there. And then symptoms as, again, I just kind of don't feel right, right? So it's more subjective. It's not like I can't see and give it a grading. It's more like, eh, I kind of feel like this, okay? Um, lesions could be a specific local change in the tissue, right? You have a, a cut or a boil that bursts through or something like that. Um, the syndrome can be a collection of signs and symptoms, and then we can use those diagnostic tests, which are various laboratory tests, and these are going to be appropriate to manifest and, um, you know, figure out what's going on and help try to diagnose you, and then also um, pairing this up with your medical history to try to um, figure out what's actually going on. 
you have remissions and exacerbations, and this is going to mark the course or the progress of the disease. And remission is going to be a period which the manifestations or the, the presentation of that disease is going to go away or subside, where exacerbation is it's being um, increased, right? So it's a worsening severity level. You can also have precipitating factors, and these are where a condition you have a condition that triggers an acute episode. Um, and then you can also have complications, which would be secondary or tertiary additional problems that um, are like come about because of the presentation of this disease. So it's going to be like comorbidities, right? Things that happen along with um, the actual disease that's going on. Um, therapy would be like the measures that you take to promote the recovery or slow the progress of the disease. Um, sequelae, this is potential unwanted outcomes that you are not looking forward to and you try to avoid. And then you also have the convalescence or rehabilitation. And this would be a period of recovery um, that it takes in order to return you to a healthy state. Um, with the disease progress, we have a couple different terms again, like this first lecture is going to be a lot of terms and I know that, but then we're going to start getting into more of the diseases and the manifestations of it, but we have to start with a couple of ground rules, right? So morbidity would be the disease rates within a group. Mortality is the number of deaths that result from that disease. Um, again, the autopsy is going to be after the patient dies, it's a post-mortem examination. Then we also have epidemiology, and this would be tracking the pattern or occurrence of the disease. And the two major players of that is going to be the World Health Organization, or WHO, and the CDC, which is the Centers of Disease Control. And so again, both of these um, centers have been very instrumental in tracking and, you know, creating a, a treatment pathway for the COVID-19 virus that's going on right now. Um, so the occurrence of the disease, we have two subterms. We have incidence and prevalence. So the incidence is going to be the number of new cases in a given population within a given time period, where the prevalence is going to be the number of new, old, or existing cases within a given population and time period. We also have ap um, epidemics, and this would be where we have a higher number of expected cases in an infectious disease that occurs within an area. And then we have what's going on right now in the world with a pandemic. And this is where we're going to involve a higher number of infectious diseases in many regions of the globe. COVID-19 spreads across all countries right now, right? Um, communicable diseases. These are infectious diseases that can spread from one person to another. Um, we also have notifiable or reportable diseases, and these must be reported by the physician to the designated authority. Then the authority, is, that authority figure is going to vary within the local jurisdiction, but the required diseases to be reported may change over time. Like some of them are like AIDS um, and things like that. And like right now with COVID, we have to um, self-report <clears throat> so we can do contact tracing, et cetera. Um, and the reporting is going to um, the utilization of this is to intend to prevent the further spread of the disease. So as annoying as it may be, it's actually for a good reason. So you have to do that. Okay. So looking at this um, figure here, we have the prevalence, which again is going to be the number of new and old cases, and that's going to be in red. And then you have the incidence, which is the number of new cases, and that's going to be in green. And so when you have the number of cases um, over a month and it peaks, then this can be an epidemic, which would be a large temporary increase in cases. So it's when it slow it slowly starts up and gains traction, and then it peaks, and then hopefully it starts going down. Unfortunately, what we've seen with COVID-19 is it peaks, and then it goes, and then it peaks higher, and then it goes, and then it peaks, and it goes, and it peaks, and it goes, and we're still kind of on the upswing. So we're trying to get things under control. So at the cellular level, your cells can actually adapt. And so they can undergo atrophy, hypertrophy, or hyperplasia. So what an atrophy means is that you have a decrease in the cell's uh, size. And so this results in, for instance, reduced tissue mass. mass. So, um, you know, say that you were in a horrible car accident and you were, you know, in the hospital for months and you can't move, right? So your muscles are going to atrophy. They're actually going to shrink because you're not using them. On the opposite hand, Anna, you can have hypertrophy, and this would be an increase in cell size, and this is going to result in enlarged tissue masses. 
And then you also have hyperplasia, and this would be like an increased number of the number of cells. And this results again in enlarged tissue mass. So hypertrophy is kind of just like swelling um, of that cell where hyperplasia is a growth of that cell population to actually increase the overall number. So here are a couple of abnormal cell growth patterns. Again, you have normal. Atrophy is when they shrink. Hyperplasia, look for your root words. Hyper means um, bigger or above, right? And so that's going to be um, the bigger ones. Uh, then we have uh, yeah, hypertrophy is like the swelling, right? Then you have, um, you know, metaplasia where you have your different replacement cells are growing in differently. Uh, necroplasia or malignancy right and they're going to just be scattered all over the board versus dysplasia so you can see that there's a lot of different growth patterns here okay um so defining each of those we have metaplasia and that would be where this um, mature cell type is replaced by a different mature cell type dysplasia is where we have the cells that are going to vary in size and shape within a tissue Anaplasia is where we have undifferentiated cells with variable nuclear and cell structures. And then we also have neoplasia, which is going to be that new growth, and this is commonly called a tumor. So when we talk about cell damage, well, we can have a couple different types. We have apoptosis, and this refers to programmed cell death. And this is a normal occurrence in the body. Okay, so our hands, when we're born, we have webs in between them. But because of apoptosis, that webbing goes away. So it's programmed cell death so that we have our fingers, you know, separated. Um, ischemia, ischemia, sorry, would be when we have a deficiency of oxygen that occurs within the cell. And so then they can, they can die off, right? Um, hypoxia, again, is going to be reduced oxygen in tissues, which is going to cause nutritional deficits. And then you also have uh, paroptosis, and this would be resulting in a lysis or the busting apart of a cell that's going to cause nearby um, inflammation. Um, pyropsis, sorry. Right. Sometimes my brain is a little slow on stuff. All right. Continuing on with the, uh, cell damage, we can have physical damage, and this would be where we have excessive heat or exposure to cold. Um, you can also have radiation exposure that can cause physical damage to your cells. You can have mechanical damage, and this would be where you have pressure or tearing of tissues. And you can also have chemical toxins, which can cause damage to your cells. And this would be from exogenous, which would mean um, outside or from the environment, or endogenous, which means inside the body. So through this whole course, you'll see that I'm very big on root words. And so um, exo is outside, exoskeleton, outside skeleton, like on bugs, right? Endo is inside. So, um, you know, just kind of, if you ever get lost in a word, try to look for the root words and see what you can come up with. Okay. Um, you can also have microorganisms that can cause damage. This would be like bacterial and viruses um, that can cause uh, cell damage as well. You can also have abnormal metabolites, and this could be from genetic disorders or inborn errors of metabolism, as well as altered metabolism in the body. You can um, also finally have imbalance of fluids or electrolytes that can cause these cell damage. So think of elephantitis, right? So you have like very large weeping sores on legs and extremities because there's fluids that are um, leaking out. So those are some examples. Necrosis is um, also an important term, and this is where we have dying cells that can cause further damage um, that are due to the cellular disintegration. And so you have a couple different types of uh, necrosis. One is the liquefaction necrosis, and this is where those dead cells are going to liquefy because they release um, the cell enzymes, and it causes it literally to like ooze and be... Um, interesting. Then you can have coagulative necrosis, and this is where you have your cell proteins that are altered or denatured, and this is going to cause coagulation or grouping together. And your book has some fun pictures <laughs> that you can go and uh, look at. And we have some coming up too. Uh, you also have, um, I guess, uh, or again, uh, fat necrosis, and this is where you have the fatty tissue broken down into different fatty acids. So the constituent fatty acids. And you can also have caseous necrosis. And this is um, what forms, this is a form of coagulation uh, necrosis. And this is where you have the thick yellow or cheesy substances that are going to form. 
So here is an example of liquefaction necrosis in the brain. So you can see in this little pocket, the actual brain tissue um, has just turned into a liquid goo and it has liquefied and it's um, affecting surrounding areas as well. Um, here's that coagulative necrosis of the kidney. So you can see that you have some areas where you have um, blood coagulation or the grouping together. That's not normal. And um, this is obviously going to cause cellular damage as well. This is a fat necrosis in the mesentery. Okay, so you can see these little fat deposits. And so that would be um, the fat necrosis. And so these are just examples. And again, these are um, pictures from your book that you can um, look at and study so that you can get familiar with them. Um, specifically talking about necrosis, you can talk about two different uh, types. And one is uh, the infarction. And this is where the area of dead cells are a result of oxygen deprivation. You can also have gangrene, and this is where the area of necrotic or the dying tissue has um, been invaded by bacteria. And it's really going to turn like that darkish black color and it can fall off if um, it doesn't get treated. And this next picture is going to show that where you can see that you have a dry gangrene of the toe. And so this is where the bacteria has invaded and it's causing the death of this tissue. And this toe will eventually fall off if it's not surgically removed. All right, so that wraps up chapter one, and I will go ahead and get this uploaded, and we'll see you in class.